Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me for Sacred Profane's second composer series installment. I'm so thrilled to be inviting Trevor Weston to join us today. Sacred Profane has co-commissioned a new work called Martyrs with C4 Ensemble on the East Coast from um, Trevor with slightly different versions for each of our ensembles. We'll speak about that a little bit more later. Um, but first, um, Trevor, I just wanted to get to know you and let our community get to know you a little bit better. Um, for me, I, I have been shocked as I've been delving into all of your phenomenal work, particularly for choral voices, that I haven't known of your music before, you know, maybe, I don't know, six or eight months ago, and I was introduced to your work. And um, it's very strange to me that I've you know, this is the first time I'm getting to know you and your repertoire because it feels very true to me in the kind of music that I tend to be drawn to. Um, you know, music that really challenges us to move beyond our barriers and to go deeper um, and to sonically challenge ourselves as well. So where have you been all my life? And you were here. <laughs> I'm so excited that, that I finally get to know you now. Well, it's funny because I, I, went to UC Berkeley for graduate school. And probably like many graduate students, I was buried under a lot of different things. Um, working at the school, I also had a little church job at St. Joseph of Arimathea, which is a tiny little Anglo-Catholic church um, on Durant, I think. Baldich, maybe. Um, so yeah, I've, uh, I was in Berkeley for a while, then I traveled a lot. That also has a lot to do with it. I moved to Indiana, I taught there for a while, and then I lived in Charleston, South Carolina for nine years, and now I'm back in uh, Brooklyn and I teach in New Jersey. So um, yeah, it is bizarre considering our connections through like Marika Kuzma that we haven't connected before, but everything happens when it's supposed to happen. That's what I like to think. Well, yeah, well, I'm glad that at least it finally has, and I'm, it's really wonderful. So. Yeah, you know, actually, you're out, you're sort of jumping in on questions that I have lined up for you. But let's start with your initial inspiration. What led you into the field of music and particularly composition? What were your initial inspirations or sparks? Well, I started um, serious kind of study of music at St. Thomas Choir School in New York City. Um, I think the story goes that when I was in, well, there are a few stories, but um, one, I came home from school and told my mother, I think in third grade, that I was in the choir singing alto. And she said, alto, you can't sing alto, you're a choir boy. You have to sing, tell her you have to sing soprano. Mm -hmm. My mother was from Barbados and grew up with the Anglican tradition. So the idea of a boy singing alto didn't make sense to her. And I remember after that, hearing a lot of recordings of like King's College. And um, I think I started singing in the local church that we attended, a Grace Episcopal Church. And that started because my father said he was practicing, do you know um, The Seven Last Words of Christ by Dubois? Dubois? Uh, yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So he used to always sing the tenor solo and he liked buying the recording and listening to it. And apparently I walked in the room and said, dad, you don't know this yet? And I sang the whole solo. So they said, okay, we're going to put him in a choir. So I started in this choir as a choir boy. And then someone in that church at Grace Church had children who went to St. Thomas. So they recommended me to go to St. Thomas. So I went to St. Thomas Choir School, which is a boarding school, singing weekly church services. I started piano lessons there. And I guess composition came later. Um, instead of practicing the piano, I would make up little tunes. Um, but in college, I went to Tufts University, I was playing the organ for a campus-wide service. I think it might've been in Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. service. And the composer TJ Anderson who taught at Tufts was at the um, ceremony, came up to me and said, why aren't you majoring in music? And I thought, oh, cause I don't wanna be a performer. And he said, come and talk to me. So we spoke, we spoke about composition and even though I knew composers existed, obviously, because of St. Thomas and singing a lot of choral music, I did not think of it as a career until I spoke to TJ. So that's really how it started. And I started studying composition with him. And he said, you need to go to graduate school. And he recommended 
UC Berkeley, and specifically to study with Ali Wilson, who was another mentor. So that's that's how it all started. Yeah, that's actually was, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about your time at UC Berkeley and what that time meant for you. Um, you know, you referred to your to your mentors, Ali Wilson. Um, were there other composition teachers? What did you gather from them? And are there relationships from that time that are still with you now? So I, I started at Berkeley really right after Tufts. So I was really young and it represented a huge change in so many positive ways. First, Ali Wilson, who's a fantastic composer, fantastic human, um, taught a course in African-American music history, which um, he approached from making connections between the way Africans approach playing music that is similar to the way African-Americans do. He calls them conceptual approaches. So that idea of kind of knowing what make music sound black, as it were. I mean, black American was a revelation. So that was fantastic. Um, and also just coming into contact with composers who I knew a little bit about, but I got to meet Ligeti at some point at Berkeley. Um, Ludoslawski, didn't meet him, but I saw him at San Francisco um, uh, Symphony. And I also studied with Andrew Imbri, great composer. Um, Richard Felciano, also great composer, and a lot of friends who I'm still in contact with, um, other composers who I still see, um, and of course, Marika Kuzma, my first graduate student teaching position was one of her assistants for her first semester at UC Berkeley, and I'm still in contact with Marika, in fact, this summer. Um, we might talk about uh, this piece that I wrote, Visions of Glory, and she contacted me and said, you know, I want to make a, have someone make a video to this piece. Can I do so? So Berkeley and my experience in California really framed me because I believe I became an adult in the Bay Area. And that changed me in different ways. When I moved to California in 1989, there was in the East Coast, there wasn't any food culture as there, or there was a food culture, but a different food culture. Like this idea of eating healthy was not quite there yet or how people approach drinking wine. Or to me, I discovered Thai food in the Bay Area. I discovered the gamelan in the Bay Area. I took West African drumming with CK Vazekro while I was at Berkeley. All of these kind of sonic cultural kind of um, important changes I, I experienced in the Bay Area and stuck with me. I remember moving, I mean, visiting friends in New Jersey and we went out and I asked the waiter if I could get a large salad. I'm like, what do you mean? You know, I, and then I said, well, do you have a cappuccino? I was like, what are you talking about? My friend's like, what are you, what are you doing? Like, and I realized at that point, like, wow, I'm actually from the Bay Area. <laughs> um, so it had a huge effect on me. Yeah, yeah, we are definitely culture snobs out here and we, we, we prize our good foods. Yes, and for those of you that are watching and listening, if you don't know, Marika Kuzma, in addition to having been the longtime um, director of choral activities at UC Berkeley, was a past conductor of Sacred and Profane um, for a, a few years and um, had much to do with you know, the evolution of the ensemble and our identity and the kind of music that we sing and continues to be connected with us. Um, and in particular is very, very, very close friends with our founding member, George Ann Bowers, who still sings with us, as you all know. Okay. Um, so yeah, we have all these different little connections in that way.
you know, you speak about being introduced to composers like Ligeti and Lutislavsky and I imagine Penderecki and, you know, those that sort of sonic world. Um, you know, Sacred and Profane does a lot of music from Sweden in particular, and all of those composers were very connected to the choral community in Sweden through Erik Eriksson as well. And I, and I, I didn't even think about that before you just mentioned those composers, but I'm thinking about the way you write for voices in particular. Your sonic world for the choral instrument seems to lend itself or maybe draw something from that tradition. And I'm, I'm just curious about your idea of the, of the choral um, instrument, what you're trying to solicit, what it is that you're writing to, what your inspirations are, and what your world is in that area. Well, I'll say, um, you know, Ligeti Lubislavsky in particular. In fact, before I started at Berkeley, I remember having a conversation with Ali Wilson and he said, you know, before you come, go listen to these composers. He gave me a list of composers. Some of them I was already listening to, but he just, go listen to Charlie Parker, go listen to Schoenberg, go listen to Ligeti Lubislavsky, listen to more Bartok. And specifically, I think with Ligeti, but especially Lubislavsky in his writing for strings and composed aleatoric kind of, you know, repeated um, snippets of music that kind of work, um, you know, through different aleatoric processes. As soon as I heard that, I thought of voices. I thought of individual singers um, performing these little lines. And that is something that I, for a long time, I thought, well, how am I going to do that? And it, I finally did that in Ashes, but that sound and that possibility of taking individuals and making them sound like a huge crowd or sound like a large room of people singing similar things at the same time, that to me um, speaks to using music to make any room sound larger than it is or making a space that feels larger and therefore maybe more expressive. So that's something that always spoke to me. Um, and therefore the music of both of those composers had a huge influence on the textures that I love that were resulted from that. That's interesting. I wonder also if your, you know, since your initiation to the world of making music was through your own experience as a singer, as a boy singer, if that's also sort of influenced what you're looking to hear from other voices. Well, yes, I can say, and this is bizarre because I am in my 50s, which is bizarre saying in itself, <laughs> but I realized sometime last semester, I was talking about my music with some people and I realized that when I interviewed or um, auditioned for St. Thomas, it was in March of what, 1977. And when I walked into the church, they were practicing the Allegri. Um, the Miserere by Allegri. Mm -hmm. And my home church, Grace Church, was actually working on the same piece because it was Lent. And hearing the difference, I, I started crying. I didn't know what I was hearing, the, the beauty of the singing, the space, everything, it just all hit me. And I think that approach to creating music where there's a choir and a semi-chorus had such a strong effect on my kind of musical outlook that I kind of forget that Ash is the gentlest thing. I have a few pieces where there's a semi-chorus and there's a main chorus. And I think it's connected to that possibility, which maybe is connected to the issue of Ligeti and Ludosowski, of creating a larger space by having a communication across kind of spaces, but also um, musical expression because in both cases, the uh, the gentlest thing and in ashes, the semi-chorus kind of approaches the music from a different vantage point. And having that combination helps to express something larger than one choir singing um, by themselves, as it were. Mm -hmm. so that's that sound. And I think the aspects of maybe Anglican chant definitely have influenced what I've written and maybe type of singing has um, is there in the back of my head always that sort of sound world the kind of Anglican 
um, sound um, because it's what I grew up doing. And sometimes when I'm in the car, that's what I put on and I sing along. So that's always there. Yeah, yeah. You've, um, you've written quite a lot of music focused on um, racial justice and social justice themes. And I'm curious about what led you there and your evolution um, and if it's different writing music that's addressing those issues now that, you know, a, a broader spectrum of people have seemed to finally become aware that racial justice is actually an issue and a problem in, you know, in our society at large. Um, yeah. So actually, you know, I realized um, when I was a, at Berkeley, I wrote a piece called um, Streams and Streams was a work for PR ensemble plus percussion. And it came about because a friend of mine <clears throat> sent me a card. Um, he was at Berkeley and graduated. He was an undergrad, I was a graduate student. And it was a friendly reminder that I forgot his birthday, but his birthday <laughs> coincided with Robert Kennedy's birthday. And he sent me a famous quotation from Robert Kennedy, which I'm forgetting about justice represented by kind of a drop of water becoming ripples and rippling out. And so that piece was based on that idea. So I think I've always, I've always been inspired by something more than maybe just the music. And it didn't, not always, you know, political, but that has always interested me. Um, when it comes to my choral pieces, I could say Ashes, which was in response to 9-11, was the beginning of this journey because, um, no, I take that back. The gentlest thing, which uses a chapter from the Tao, you know, gentlest thing is stronger, is kind of a political statement or a philosophical statement. Um, and it seemed to be simpatico with how I saw the world. And at a certain point I realized, well, to write your best music, you should definitely write about things that mean something to you. Mm -hmm. And maybe in response to something. So for Ashes, um, again, I grew up in New York City area, um, the tri-state area, as we call it. My sister worked across the street from um, World Trade Center, saw the second plane. Um, and I remember it was difficult to write the piece at first. I, it took a few months, but I wanted to write something that addressed the issue of suffering because you saw so much suffering on the television. And in a way, all of my political pieces or pieces that deal with political issues deal with this issue of human suffering. Um, Martyrs in particular deals with everything that we experience over the summer through George Floyd, through the pandemic, through Breonna Taylor. And I think the most difficult thing that humans try to do is make sense of suffering or why it exists or why people do things. And to me, that's powerful. I mean, the Psalms, I think, are a wonderful text because they, I think, aid the readers in, in dealing with these, these serious problems. And to me, it's a way to, it's a cathartic process for me to deal with it. Well, how can I respond to this? Well, maybe if I say something and I use the music to do it because words are, can only go so far. The great thing about art is that you can apply a lot of different things which might seem to be at odds with each other to maybe present a more complex idea or a more complex version of this idea because you are opening up a discussion about this topic where the listener has to do the thinking and you're not telling them what to think. You're just presenting the information out there. I just want to do God's will. And he has allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. 
I think specifically with my musical language, I realized really in the Curie to Messe Ancienne, which I wrote in 19, well, the date is 1996, but I really started it in 1994. I was working on this piece and near the end, I decided to add this minor third variation in the tenor part. And I thought, wow, that sounds like the blues. And then, I was living in Paris and I thought, wow, that sounds very American. Mm -hmm. And then I started thinking about rock and roll and American popular music and how much of the language is based on kind of blues ideas and blues riffs. And also how most Americans hear this all the time and it makes sense to us because it's kind of our lingua franca. So in using that um, tradition, it, at one point is maybe political because I'm saying, hey, this is American music. And two, it's a way to communicate um, using elements or musical ge gestures that many people understand or have experienced. That's so, 
so interesting for, for me to hear you speak about that because that minor third ostinato recurs in martyrs quite a lot as well. So yeah. knowing where the origins of that minor third come from is really meaningful. That's that's wonderful. So, you know, I always like to say in, you know, the Beatles love me do, you know, love, love me do, love, 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 love me do. That's coming from a different tradition. Mm -hmm. And we all know that. And we don't think about well, what is that? Why are they going, whoa, love, that's blues, that's gospel, that's coming from kind of the, you know, the base of an African American kind of vocal expression. So yeah, if you listen to, I mean, most popular, I mean, you hear it all over the place. Like, wow, it's a minor third. In fact, <laughs> Gershwin wrote about that in, what is it, the machine age. He said that the minor third was the most, or the interval of the machine age or the interval of kind of American music. And when I first read that, I thought, what does he mean? But I realized, oh, because he realizes the blues has such an important um, expressive component in jazz music and his music was obviously influenced by jazz um, and that music was influenced by the blues and the tradition of music making or as Ali Wilson would say pendular thirds which is so much a part of kind of basic African-American kind of melodic expression. Wow that's this is such an exciting conversation I love this it's like pulling all these things together for me right now um, and yeah and I feel like you've you've um, you've dug into some of my questions about the text for martyrs, um, where that came from. Um, you also referenced Dufay's 15th century isorhythmic motets on Saint Sebastian, um, in addition to the songs of David. Um, and then you weave in your own text, um, I Can't Breathe, which obviously references our twin pandemics right now of, um, you know, all these, these Black Americans being killed by police and also, of course, the coronavirus you know, and all these people that are uttering those words as they're facing death. Um, I'm wondering if there's anything more you want to say about that. I feel like you've already touched on that, but also how the music of martyrs specifically sort of solicits some of those ideas. So I should start with, um, again, I I often go to the Psalms when I want to, because the, the language is, the poetry is fantastic and kind of speak to the human uh, condition. Um, and after everything that occurred during the summer, I was working on some other pieces and I found that I could not, it was difficult writing as I think a lot of people, a lot of creative people had problems during the pandemic because there was so much to think about. Um, and then I was contacted by C4 saying, hey, do you think you want to write a piece? And I thought, yes, I do. I need to do something. And I, this is true for many of us. I want to write because it's who I am, but I also kind of need to write just to to process. So um, the Dufayi comes through in a different way in that I love Dufayi, love isorhythmic rotets, but when I was at the College of Charleston, I taught in honors Western civilization, um, kind of from, I don't know, Egypt up to and including the Renaissance. And it was my job. It was, of course, I was team taught by a historian with someone in another discipline. So I was paired with a historian. So I gave all the lectures on music going through the ages. And so when talking about kind of the change from medieval to Renaissance, I remember playing this same um, um, motet, which I found out was written in response to the plague. And while I was on stage playing and I thought, wow, that's really, just thinking about how we and why we write music now. And here's a piece specifically to address a very current issue. And not only that, but at the time writing an ISO rhythmic motet in that tradition was the highest kind of uh, form of music creation. And I thought, well, for this play, considering everything that's happening, you know, Black Lives Matter, that issue, huge issue, obviously, of course. And then at the same time, this pandemic where some people are pretending that it's, not, or they're saying it's not actually real and people are dying. And especially in, in the East Coast and in New York, and I'm, I live in Brooklyn, you just heard the bells from the church down the street. Um, in April, I had friends who were posting all the time, all I hear are ambulances, you know, I, it was so dire and, 
to approach the the fear. There was just fear. Um, I thought that 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 piece by Dufay and also the the um, the text and the seriousness in the request for kind of compassion was something that um, I wanted to address. And also, like you said, in both situations, not being able to breathe, which is connected to you know some religious ideas. I'm the breath of life. This idea of life being breath. Um, God, you know, the, I think you breathe across the face of the waters, all of these traditions about where breath is connected to creation and living. And in both situations, that's the one thing that is taken from the person. Um, I think that it was important to try to show the similarity and in both cases, feeling that people were dying for no good reason, meaning a lot more could have been done to to lower the number of people who have suffered through COVID. And obviously a lot could have been done in specific situations where maybe someone could have just taken a step back and said, well, maybe sir, you shouldn't do this as opposed to deciding that they're gonna put their, their knee on that person's neck. Um, and I thought that that is also what kind of different religious traditions kind of address. It's not just death, we're all going to die, but it's what's considered um, unnecessary and untimely and you know death that comes through unnecessary unnecessarily kind of violent acts or in a weird way in both cases it's not just the action it's the um the fact that people have are not concerned or they're are careless in it like well that's someone else's problem or it's not me so i'm not going to worry about it Maybe I'm not going to wear a mask because I don't really think it's necessary. Um, or, well, maybe they should have listened to the police policemen and then maybe that wouldn't have happened, which it also makes it worse. That idea that the person who died, died not because something bad was done, but because they did something that they should not have done. Yeah. yeah um, in, the, in the musical setting of the work, you know, it brings me back to what you were speaking about with um you know the idea of cyclical repetition and you know ostinati that repeat and that sort of creating of a larger space and i'm thinking about how this work is constructed how you how you approach writing for remote choir and of course your your versions for c4 ensemble and for sacred and profane are slightly different in that the sacred and profane version is a little bit more aleatoric because we we don't have some of the um technical um, expertise that C4 has for having more times and coordinated rhythmic structures. So I'm wondering how that process of writing has been new for you and how it informed your ability to meet this particular text, you know, how those two things kind of came together, writing for the remote, remote choral experience where we're all sort of tuning in from different spaces and we have the asynchronicity issues and the dropout issues. And then we're also dealing with this really rich subject matter in the text as well. So um, I am working on the C4 piece. I, I did some work and I sent it to um, one of the singers who shared it with, and as you know, they're all composers and conductors and I got feedback. Um, and what helped in the feedback, and this might sound strange, but it makes sense. I, I teach and I've been teaching remotely because Drew was remote um, last semester and most of us are remote this semester. And a few times in teaching um, what is our music fundamentals course, I've asked the students to sing. So I know what it sounds like when that doesn't line up. And I thought, well, how does that connect to, like you said, what this text is about, what this piece is about? And I think on some level, thinking about the, the text from the Dufayi isorhythmic motet, I'm, I'm thinking of like individuals, maybe in a religious space, kind of just praying to themselves. And we're somehow hearing them, even though they're not doing it for us, but we kind of walk into this space that has a lot of reverberation. And so we're hearing different people 
doing similar prayers at the same time. And that's how I approached it. That's how I thought of it. And that's, and to me, that is, um, you know, connected to, to things I've witnessed but never experienced, like seeing people at the Wailing Wall kind of all praying. And I, I can't hear them, but you can tell that they are doing similar things together. So it's kind of, you know, adjacent kind of pleading and praying. And I think that through the technology, if it doesn't link up, that's fine. Because what I'm imagining are people who are not paying attention to what the other person is doing, because the whole idea is that they have to say this in order for it to get out the prayer that they know is necessary at that moment. And so if it doesn't line up, that's fine. Because the we're all going in the same direction and how we get there and when we get there isn't as important as it being said or sung so that's how i approached it yeah i love i love that reference to you know praying at the prayer wall in jerusalem and then how that ties in also with the text from the songs of um or the the psalms of david um which come from that same tradition of, of you know as you referenced before grieving and how grieving and, and singing are intercorrelated and um, yeah, and the, the process of the, the place where art meets the need to grieve, you know, how it addresses that moment. And the power of that also came to me through ashes in a performance after performance a long time ago, this man came up to me and said, I haven't heard those, that, those psalms or those texts from that psalm since I was a little kid in the synagogue and that's what the old people would say and it's almost he said it's almost like they did it because it had to do with so much sorrow they didn't really want us to worry about it yeah. and that is something that kind of stuck with me that there you know some things are there because it's difficult to address those problems and and you know, in doing that work, you're kind of doing the work for, for the community. Yes. Um, and so I definitely went to the Psalms and obviously this idea of breathing and not being able to open your mouth, that phrase came to mind and I was looking at it and then I realized, oh, I can't breathe. Like that's what they were going to say, which is what kind of connects everything we've been talking about, so. Yes, all of it, yeah. Well, we are more than thrilled. I am more than thrilled to have this opportunity to, to perform this work. Um, and I believe it is the beginning of a long relationship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really looking forward to being able to continue to explore your work. And, you know, and some of the pieces you've referred to today, um, you know, Ashes in particular, and a um, number of the other pieces as well. And so very excited for that time when we're able to sing back in person again and can you know dig deeper into those other pieces too. Um, and what's coming down the pike, because I'm sure that there's more on its way. Yeah, there, uh, I'm trying to think. Right now I'm working on a piano piece. Um, there are tentative plans for larger choral pieces. So I can't really talk about them now because it's still tentative, but yeah. um, you know, I think it's, more of the same it takes a whole lifetime to figure out who you are <laughs> so i'm still in that process yeah. and you know focusing on things that i find of interest I, I do think that during the pandemic you know there's a lot of alone time there's a lot of quiet time and you know i think what we do need i think everyone realized people who are non-musicians realize all right now that i'm at home what am i going to do i need to listen to music i need to connect to art and if there is a positive, hopefully it's that we all respect the fact that art is more than entertainment and always has been, mm -hmm. that it really is necessary for humans to, to, to do art, to feel ourselves and understand ourselves and what we're going through, mm -hmm. so. Absolutely, and to, and to connect on a deeper level with other people. And to connect to other, exactly, and to connect. And because be said or articulated intellectually, that can be felt, that shared felt experience. Because words fail, you know, you know, you can say this all you want, but when you hear someone expressing or when you see someone through a painting or through drawing or through a sculpture, or when you see someone through dance, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, it makes sense. And it connects to the reality of our existence is all of the things that we can never really explain but experience, which is part of being human. And I think that's what art addresses. Absolutely. I, I couldn't end this conversation on a better note. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for meeting with me today and, and um, allowing us to perform this wonderful piece of yours. And um, well, I'm honored. I am looking forward to hearing the performance. I'm so happy this is occurring. And, and thank Likewise. you. Likewise. Thank you so much. Take care. Take Goodbye. Care.